So we're going into part two of this, going on to page 31 in your springboard book. And when you get there, you can see it, there's a poem there um, called I Remember. Before that, there are some learning targets for it it's there. It's, it mentions that you want to analyze the way a poet uses imagery and diction to create particular effects. So my first question to you is, because a lot of people put imagery as a word they know on our QHT chart, what is imagery? What does that mean? What section is it? It's 1.5. Yeah. So um, what is imagery? Nobody? How about I put it this way? Have you ever been reading a book, reading a story, and you start getting that little movie going on in your head of what's going on in that story? You start picturing it in your mind instead of just taking the words from the page? How many of us have done that before? Okay. Have you ever done it to a point where you read a book that they made into a movie, and then you, you go to see the movie and you're like, wait, that's not what you're supposed to look like, or that's not what you're supposed to sound like? Some that never have for you, but some of you have. I had a lot of people mention Harry Potter right. with this. You say the movie's always right? Is that what you say? <laughs> well, they said Harry Potter. They said Hermione wasn't supposed to look that way and, you know, whatever else it might be. For me, it's, um, I don't know, has anybody here ever seen the Jack Reacher movies? Who's the main character? Who plays the main character? Do you? Yeah. Who plays the main character? Tom Cruise. Tom Cruise is five feet seven inches tall and he's a brunette. Jack Reacher in the book is six feet four and muscular and blonde. Okay, so if you read the books and then you went in and you saw Tom Cruise, you'd be like, when's Jack Reacher gonna get here? Okay, don't get me wrong, Tom Cruise is a great actor, but he's not six four or blonde. Okay? Um, for me, it happened with uh, the book It, you know, Steve from Stephen King. And not the newer versions of the movie, but the original movie that they made. Um, it was back in the late 80s, early 90s, I think it was. Um, maybe it was mid 90s. I don't know, I'd have to look it up. But all of the actors who played the, the main characters in this um, were sitcom stars when I was a kid. So they were in comedy TV shows when, you know, when I was a little kid. So it was hard to get into the movie when you sit there and go, Wait, that was the judge from Night Court, or that's John Ritter. He was in Three's Company and all that type of stuff, which of course were shows that were gone long before you guys were born, so I don't even know if you're familiar with them. Um, but anyway, that's kind of the use of imagery right there, okay? You start to get this mental picture. You start to get this um, idea in your head of the way things are supposed to look or sound or smell, okay? Which is why we just did that free write, a quick write on your sensory details from that memory, okay? What did you see, hear, taste, touch, smell? This poem that we have in front of us, written by Edward Montez, he does this a lot throughout it, okay? He starts giving us sensory details to help us almost imagine like we're there with him. We can experience it. Because even when he says something like, I remember the cry of an owl in the night, you may not have ever really heard an owl coming from the forest, like screeching from the forest. Maybe you did, maybe you didn't. But I'll bet you heard a bird crying somewhere where you're just like, what was that? Or, you know, um, you might not know exactly where they were, but you heard that bird cry, right? So you would be able to relate to this in some fashion. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to read this poem out loud. While I read through it out loud, I want you to go through here and mark this poem in your book, okay? It's just the bottom of 31 and then a little bit on the top of 32. And what I want you to mark is, first of all, underline any memories the author describes that gives you that mental image or that gives you that reaction to it, okay? Like, if it's a sound, 
and you're like, okay, I can almost imagine this sound, or I can imagine this sound, underline it, okay? If there's anything where you might have a question or a comment about, or you notice something that somebody else might miss, I want you to circle it, okay? And then we'll talk about it when we're done here. Okie dokie. All right. So it's called I Remember by Edward Montez. I remember the scent of acorn soup cooking. I'm sorry, let me start that over. I remember the scent of acorn soup cooking and deer meat frying in quiet evenings of summer and shivering under thin blankets in winter and watching the wallpaper dance to the force of the winter winds outside. I remember the cry of an owl in the night and I knew it was an ominous warning, a cry of death. I remember running in the dust behind the medicine truck when it came to the reservation. Lifesavers was a free treat. And grandpa sitting in his favorite resting chair under his favorite shade tree with his dog Ollie by his side. I remember running naked and screaming with my aunt in hot pursuit, a stick in her hand. She always caught me. And every summer we would swim in the river and let the sun bake us until we were a shade less than purple, basking on the riverbank, undisturbed, at peace. And I remember grandma toiling in the bean fields while I played with my army truck on the fender of a 49 Plymouth. I remember going to the movies in town on Saturday nights with 50 cents in my pocket, 35 cents for the ticket, and the rest was mine. Eating popcorn and drinking water from a discarded Coke cup and rooting for the Indians to win. And they never did, but that was yesterday. All right. So <laughs> I'm curious, what were some of the uh, sensory details you underlined, the images you got? Jenna, what's one? Okay, so you can almost like picture that sound coming out, right? Yeah. Good. What's another one, Carson? Deer meat frying. The deer meat frying. Yes, I'm from southwestern Pennsylvania. Deer meat is a big deal there. Okay, I bet if you looked in my mom's freezer right now, there wouldn't be any cow meat. It would just all be deer. LJ, you have another one? Shivering under thin blankets in winter. Oh yeah, shivering, shivering under thin blankets in winter. Without giving too much away, um, this was a story I told earlier in the day. Um, I experienced something similar to that lots of nights, even last night, for example. Because my wife is one of those where I, I like a cold room and then thick blankets to lay underneath. You know, that to me, I think it's the best way to sleep. But my wife is one of those that will like grab a hold of the blankets like this and really snuggle with it. And then she rolls. But when she rolls and I'm laying on the bed, I feel the blanket just slide right off of me, you know? Or if I don't feel it, I happen to sleep through that part, I wake up and I'm just like shaking like this, realizing all I have is like maybe a sheet covering me from the knees down, you know? Um, even now thinking about that, I kind of get the goosebumps a little bit of how, how cold that can be or how cool that can be. So, you know, that's something that when I read through it, I, I felt it almost as I was reading it. What else? Do you have another one? Oh, that's what I did your hand up. Yeah. Those, those relaxing, realizing you don't have to go to school tomorrow because it's summertime and you know, you're just sitting there quietly. You had all your fun throughout the day and now it's just time to wind down. That's a good one. What else? Yeah, some people ask, what is that all about? Like, when are you like running naked and screaming, you know, with your aunt running with a stick? I pictured kind of little, little kids in this, like he was remembering a time when he was really little. And um, little kids, there's no like distinction between being dressed time and naked time, okay? Oftentimes with little guys, um, you know, I remember this with both my kids, my son especially when he was little, little, 
you know, you get them out of the tub, you dry them off, and you're like, okay, stand there. I'm going to go get you your clothes or something. Like, or I got to reach for this other towel or whatever it is. And he just standing there, like, nodding his head. And then as soon as you turn, you hear a little noise. You look back, the towel's still there, and he's gone. Okay, it's naked time. He's running through the house, <laughs> okay, whatever it might be. Um, that's kind of what I pictured with this, too, and the ant chasing after him with the stick. What else? There are a lot more in there, aren't there? We might go, yeah, what do you have? Did Carson say something about every summer he would swim in the river? But he talked about the quiet summer nights, but that's a good one, too. Yeah, yeah swimming in the river. They, he talks about um, letting the sun bake them until they were shade less than purple. You know, you let yourself almost burn <laughs> or you burn, you know, just enough so that uh, then when it eases off, you have a nice tan going or whatever. Yeah, these are all, you know, and there are a lot more in here. Things that you could sense, you could remember. Okay, you felt something similar to this yourself. Okay, and that's what helps build this imagery. What, what else that does is that pulls you as the reader into the story into the poem right he could have just given us factual data like say this happened then this happened then this happened then this happened but instead he talked about it as if you know you can feel it what kind of life do you think he led as a child how, how, how was his childhood was it all happy and sunshine there was definitely some joy there right some of the things we talked about were joyous the food the um he talks about seeing his grandpa sitting in his favorite resting chair under the shade of a tree with his dog there that seems like a peaceful scene but what else yeah say it again eating popcorn and drinking water. yeah eating popcorn and drinking water now, that whole section there at the end is pretty interesting. First of all, when he's talking about eating the popcorn, it was with the money he had left over when he went into the movies, right? 35 cents to get into the movies, he was given 50 cents. So he had 15 left over. One of the things he did was get some popcorn. So that gives us a time period. Was this a recent story? Is he remembering a recent childhood? No. The 49 Plymouth. Now, somebody could technically have a 49 Plymouth now, but most likely he wouldn't be sitting on top of it running a race car over it while his grandma's working. Okay? So this was a while back. And when he gets the Coke, does he buy the Coke? Is he buying a Coke? Is that what he has with the Coke cup? No. Like LJ said, he's drinking water out of a cup that he found. Right? Um, he goes into the theater. What kind of movie is he watching there? What's that? This is always a tricky question to answer, especially in Northern Ohio. When you saw he was rooting for the Indians, what did you think? The baseball team. But he's in the movies and he's rooting for the Indians. Yeah, and earlier he said he lived on a reservation, right? He said the medicine truck came. You're running in the dust behind the medicine truck on the reservation. Who is he? He's a Native American. Yeah. So when he was a kid, he would go into these westerns. they go into these movies. There would always be these westerns on there, and he's rooting for the Native Americans because they were his people. But they never won. It was always the cowboy in the white hat right he was the he was the hero in these old westerns you might not know this because you know i barely watched many of those in my time but yeah the the native americans never won in those old westerns all right that's what he's talking about here so on the flip side of this happiness that he remembers from his childhood we also get this experience of he was shivering in the night under thin blankets the wind was hard enough against his thin walls that the wallpaper moved. 
okay? So it wasn't like a, you know, this solid brick house or whatever. Um, I won't try to speculate on being chased with a stick by his aunt in that part of it, okay? But how about the part when he was playing on the, on the 49 Plymouth Fender? He remembers the playing part, but what was his grandma doing? Toiling in the field. She was working in a bean field. So they, they you know, pulled this car up there and she said, you're gonna have to sit here and play while I work. Notice his parents aren't even mentioned anywhere in this. Who knows what happened to them? They mentioned his grandfather, his grandmother, and his aunt, right? So it's a possibility that there was some struggles going on in his life too. Especially since there was no doctor or pharmacy on there. They had a medicine truck that showed up every once in a while, right? And he mainly remembers that because he got lifesavers, the little candies, they were around back then. Okay, but it doesn't, you know, you can infer from this that there were people who were waiting weeks to get the medicine that they needed until that truck showed up with them. Reasonable? Okay, so what he did there was he went through this poem, he went through this, you know, this story of his childhood kind of through these memories. And he pulled us into it by giving us these sensory details, things that we could feel along with them, or we could see along with them, or we could even smell or almost taste when it comes to the deer meat, okay? I don't think any of us ever had acorn soup before. By the way, don't just stick acorn in some soup and then eat it because that's poisonous to humans. We found out this morning you have to like boil out the tannin from it that, that could kill you, and, and then you have to strain it a certain way and then re- cook it before you can make soup out of it. Yeah, but that might be all they had available. Don't eat acorns. Uh -uh. Not, not as they are. Yeah. Take that with you for future. Um, so that's what you're expected to do when you get into part three. What I would like you to do is get back into that document where you free wrote your memory. And this time you're gonna to go to that bottom box and you're gonna do the same thing that he just did. Instead of telling us this memory, you're now gonna write it in this fashion. You're gonna put, I remember, and I remember, and I remember. And I want you to specifically give us those sensory details as you go through. We'll be able to interpret your memory that way. Okay? Now, Here's a rule of thumb before all of you start going on this. You have to have a minimum of 10 lines, which shouldn't be too hard, okay? I, I'm expecting to see a lot more than that, but it's gotta be at least 10 lines. And they have to start, they have to follow this pattern of I remember. You don't have to have full stanzas because he doesn't have full stanzas. He has like two that has four lines, in, you know, four, not sentences, but you know, lines in it. Um, but you can see even he has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, just seven on the first page. So 10 lines minimum of I remember statements give us these sensory details so we can experience it with your memory with you. Everybody got it? It won't be due till Monday. I know we're running short on time right now, but uh, you can work on it as you need to.